Uh, in the summer, the kids do fall down. They do get fractured wrists. And there are different types of fractured wrists. Can you just discuss that just a little bit? The most common fractured wrist is what is called a grinstick fracture or a torus fracture. And uh, green stick fracture essentially means like if you take a green stick and bend it, uh, it would bend but not break because the bones in children are rubbery. And so they get a little bend or a little uh, buckle in the bone, but the bone is intact. That's what we see most commonly. Then you have a fracture of the wrist where the bone is broken through, completely through and through, but it's not displaced. That's a great fracture to treat because all you need is a splint or a cast. And then you have a bone that is broken and it's out of place. And so those you have to sometimes put the children to, uh, to sleep to reduce it. And then the last variety is where the growth plate is involved. When the growth plate well, is well, first involved... First of all, most people don't know what you mean by growth plate. What do you mean by growth plate? A growth plate is uh, a part of the bone where the bone grows in length. The way the children become taller is they add bone at the top part of the bone and at the bottom part of the bone, for example, in the tibia. Or how the arm will grow, there is growth plate at the wrist end of the uh, bone and there is a growth plate at the elbow end of the bone. And that's where the bone grows and that's how the arm becomes longer. And they look at an x-ray, is there something they will look on the x-ray and say this is a growth plate fracture over a non-growth plate fracture, is there anything they look yes, for? Yes, they look for? the growth plate should be straight and uh, if there is any abnormality uh, in the growth plate or a fracture that uh, passes through the growth plate, that's an epiphyseal fracture or a growth plate fracture. When you get a growth plate, do you have to handle that a particular way? Yes. Uh, the growth plate fractures are of uh, five different types. The most uh, difficult of all the growth plate fractures is where the growth plate slides off. And so half the growth plate is a little bit uh, away and the other half, half the growth plate is a little bit proximal uh, to the joint. And those we have to reduce and sometimes pin them or fix them with a screw or whatever has to be done. So when you put it back in position, does it mean it'll start growing like it should? Sometimes they develop what is called linear deformity or angular deformity, but that's because the, the cells within the growth plate are so damaged that uh, there is not much uh, you can do about it. So if you get a linear growth rate of that type, what are some other ones? The last one and the most difficult one is a growth plate fracture where the fracture extends into the joint and now the articular surface may be in place which does not cause a big problem but the articular surface the joint surface is displaced that's the fracture that always requires surgery and if you do surgery it's no guarantee you're going to have success is it? you will not have guaranteed success but at least you'll have something better than what you would get if you leave it alone and many times you use all kinds of metals and hinges and things, almost like a carpenter, don't you? So actually, you're like a carpenter a little bit, aren't you? We are like uh, gardeners. We like to consider ourselves as people dealing with wood, but how to grow the wood properly. Carpenters only cut the bone. They are cutting really... Well, you're a finished carpenter, then. I'm a finished carpenter. Okay, you make fine cabins out of the wood. But the main thing is... If there's any concern for a growth plate, that is a red flag that you've got to do something. Not a week from now, right away, is that correct? Right away. You don't look at holidays, it's, a, it's an emergency. Whether it's a holiday or no holiday, that is one fracture that needs treatment very early. And it's very common in pediatrics, if they have a, a, a wrist in one side, you worry about a fracture, sometimes you take an x-ray of the other wrist to compare, because it's sometimes difficult to see these things accurately, is that true? Absolutely true because uh, in children certain parts of the bone at the joints are not calcified yet and so uh, the x-ray is not going to show a fracture uh, through the non-calcified uh, non part. That's like a soft tissue and so with the x-ray you can only make diagnosis of calcified bone. If there is a fracture of the the end of the bone in a child that's not calcified, you can miss it easily. The only way you can do is to compare the two sides uh, 
to be able to detect. Minus sometimes control. you have to take an X-ray even a few days later to see the some changes. Yes. Sure? yes, you can take X-rays a few days after the fracture has occurred, and you will see some healing around the fracture, and that's how you can make a, a diagnosis also. But sometimes they do MRIs. Is there any gain in doing an MRI mm -hmm. in a, 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 a fracture area? There are certain fractures. Even if you compare the two sides, you cannot clearly make a diagnosis. And so, if there are fractures of the elbow, mainly the elbow in children, the only way you can make a good diagnosis uh, is if you get an MRI and see that the entire bone and the soft tissues are normal or uh, there is a discrepancy or break in the bone and the soft tissue. And what we can visualize can tell you approximately how old the kid is, is that true? Yes, the, uh, the growth pattern uh, or more specifically the calcification pattern of the eight bones, the eight marbles in the wrist, can tell you how old the child is. If you look at the wrist, you see these little ossicles. And by the number that's visualized, you can tell sometime about the age. Is that correct? Yes. And it, sometimes you see more of them. It's accelerated is an indicator of sometimes an endocrine problem. Or the opposite is true. The kid's not growing correctly, and there's less bone. So, you can actually say, I see something, and then say, you don't have to see an endocrinologist, is that correct? That is true. Uh, certain changes in the uh, number of bones uh, will occur in endocrine diseases, uh, or they could be birth defects, or sometimes uh, instead of eight bones, you see seven bones, because the bones are uh, fused with each other, what we call synostosis. Um, uh, there is one condition that called uh, nevergill Perlman syndrome that was named after Dr. Perlman from Brooklyn, uh, where the bones are, are less in number. That was your former partner? That was my former partner and my mentor and my professor, my philosopher and a friend. Lovely man. I knew him for a long time. Also, uh, some, some conditions or some medicines can make bones more friable. Is that true? Yes. Uh, I said sometimes steroids sometimes can do this. Steroids uh, very often cause uh, uh, softening of the bones, what we call uh, uh, osteoporosis. And uh, many of the children that have immunological disorders that take osteoporosis, their bones are fragile and break easily. So the basic rule is if you see an injury, you should contact your primary care physician to help you judge what you should, should not do. But sometimes the best well-meaning situations, it's sometimes very difficult to diagnose a fracture, especially a young child, is that correct? In a young child, diagnosis of a fracture is a lot more difficult than an adult. And oftentimes you have to see how the child is playing, whether he's avoiding a certain part of the body, if he does not use a part of the body, does not bend certain part of the body. That's how clinically uh, you can focus on a, on a fracture in a child.